south side of Logan Avenue, at the southeast city limits of Emporia, Kansas, stands a two-story stone house, looking slightly out of place in an area of modest one-story wooden frame family homes. It is an attractive structure, often drawing the curious attention of passers-by, sitting as it does at the north end of a small field with a small red barn just to the east. There are other houses across the street, but the nearest neighbors to the right and left are some distance away, which makes the appearance of this old farmhouse, for that is what it is, even more striking. Every house, just as every person, has a story to tell, some stories more interesting than others. This is the story of the Howe House, built only 10 years after Emporia was first settled back in 1857. It is among the oldest buildings still standing in this county seat town. The owner and builder of this house was Richard Howe, a native of Glamorganshire, South Wales. Working with stone was a skill Howe had learned from his father long before he came to Emporia in 1858. Sue Sealert is the former education director of the Lyon County Historical Museum. He was an apprentice stonemason and grew up in that and that his dad wanted to make sure he had a good trade and uh, it was very profitable for him here and it was, uh, he came here at the right time and was in um, desperate need for his services and his abilities and was able to work a lot in this vicinity and area. Soon after his arrival, Howe began plying his trade, building the first stone house in town for Judge Watson and a small frame house for himself and his family at 728 Merchant Street. In 1860, he bought 18 acres in the countryside south of the town and north of the Cottonwood River, property for which he paid $360. In preparation for building a new house on this site, a house that would be modeled after the stone farm homes he knew in Wales, Howe began accumulating native limestone and walnut boards, cut from nearby trees and planed at a local sawmill. By 1862, Howe was ready to begin construction, but was interrupted by the Civil War. During and immediately after the war, Howe earned a living at his trade, working on, among other projects, a three-story stone and brick Masonic Hall, a livery stable, and a hotel. He built the first Lyon County Courthouse in 1866. A year earlier, he built the first public school building in Emporia. He constructed the first stone building, no longer standing, on the campus of the Kansas State Normal School. Howe also helped build the stone houses for the Kaw Indians on their reservation near Council Grove. And he helped with the stonework on the historic Chase County Courthouse. In 1867, work on the house that carries his family name was completed. On the ground floor front are a dining room and a sitting room. The native limestone walls of the house are 18 inches thick, with native oak flooring and native black walnut woodwork. The unusual reddish tint of the walnut is the result of the boards having been stacked outside during the war years, according to Randy Davis. And if you notice the, the wood in the house, of course it's walnut, uh, but most walnut you see is kind of a dark black greenish tint to it, and, and much of this has a, a reddish or, or chocolate color to it. And the way I understand that is uh, Richard had left and started construction or started gathering materials for it, dropped the logs, and left to go in the, in the war. And so those, those logs sat down uh, and seasoned for a couple of years before they were cut into boards. And so that's the reason you see this uh, rich uh, chocolate color in the, in the woodwork. A close look reveals the square-headed nails in use at that time period. The two upstairs bedrooms in the front part of the house are reached from the rooms on the lower floor by a steep, narrow staircase, functional, not decorative, in keeping with Howe's practical Welsh nature. At the rear is a one-story kitchen and pantry, originally flanked by two porches. The east porch remains, but sometime in the later 19th century, the west porch was converted into a storeroom. In 1925, that storeroom was further converted into a modern bathroom. A copper kettle that hung from a crane in the fireplace had been brought from Wales. 
as had two brass candlesticks and a Seth Thomas clock. A bureau and some mirrors came over with the house from Britain, while a walnut table with wide one-piece drop leaves was made at the old Garland Furniture Factory at Soden's Mill on the Cottonwood River just a few hundred yards from the house. A crack in a small window pane, now replaced, one of a dozen panes in the large parlor window was, according to a family story, caused by Santa Claus trying to squeeze into the house. Most of the furnishings currently in the house belong to the Howe family, including a teacup commemorating the coronation of King Edward VI. After Edward's abdication to marry American divorcee Wallace Simpson, the Crown asked that these cups be returned. They had a, a cup that was, somebody gave it to them. It was um, made for the... Uh, when the uh, when they were supposed to be crowning the king in in uh, England, and he abdicated and married Wallace Simpson, and they were supposed to give these cups back, but they never did give theirs back. Sometime by the mid twentieth century, a porch that had been added to the front of the house was removed while in 1974, a one-story addition was built onto the west side. Otherwise, the Howe House looks much as it did when Richard Howe added the finishing touches in 1867. The Howe House is certainly much sturdier and solider than the log cabin where the Howe family lived in 1858. A family story tells of Richard and Sarah Howe waking one winter morning to find the bed of their baby Robert covered with snow. Richard put his son in his high chair and held an umbrella over him to keep off the snow while Mrs. Howe swept off the bed. Richard Howe, born in 1825, married Sarah Evans in Wales, the same year the couple immigrated to the New World in 1854, settling first in Canada, then in Ohio, before arriving in Emporia in 1858, bringing with them their two-year-old son Robert. A daughter Sarah was born in Emporia. She married William Owen. Young Robert Howe seems to have had an adventurous spirit. After graduating from Kansas State Normal School, now Emporia State University, he went to New Mexico in 1878 and worked in mining. In 1897, he returned to Emporia and soon after married 21-year-old Margaret Jane Griffiths, born in Birmingham, England, a girl some 20 years his junior. Three daughters were born to this union, Charlotte Elizabeth, 1899, Mary Priscilla, 1900, and Sarah Genevieve, 1905. At some point after his mother's death, which occurred in 1896, Robert and his family moved into the stone house on Logan Avenue with his father. Richard Howe had retired in 1887 because of failing eyesight and other health problems. Two months before his death at age 83, on August 20th, 1910, Richard moved from the stone house he had built to live with his daughter, Sarah Owen, who, with her family, was living in the first house her father had built in Emporia at 728 Merchant. This house he left to her. To his son, Richard left only a token $5, but that was not the result of estrangement. Rather, it was because Robert Howe had suffered a stroke in 1900, leaving him partially paralyzed and in poor health. Wanting Robert's family, who had been living with him on the Logan Avenue farm for over a decade, to be provided for, Richard willed that property to his daughter-in-law, Margaret Jane, so that she and his granddaughters would have a degree of security. And in fact, Robert died in 1912, only two years after his father. After the deaths of her husband and her father-in-law, Margaret Jane Howe and her three daughters continued to occupy the house, living conservatively but comfortably from the small income from the farm and from mining interests Robert had acquired in New Mexico. The late Catherine Kretzinger knew the Howe family well, as recalled by her son John. Well, Mom probably knew the Howes for a long time uh, on South Commercial where we live, she was born and raised there. So she very possibly met them early in her life before she was even married. Uh, I mean, they were good friends for a long, long time. 
mom just loved talking with them. She'd come down here side by herself sometimes, and and uh, Sarah would come to the house and like say my mom had an antique shop, and they'd sit out in the antique shop and talk for hours. John has memories of the house sisters when, as a child, he accompanied his mother on visits to the house. It was just kind of neat coming down here because they were older ladies and they were really, really nice. And I uh, remember as a kid, they always had a big black dog or two out in the yard that were real friendly. I didn't look at it as perfection. It just as I came in the house, everything was always nice and clean. and. The, Priscilla had her apron on, or maybe Sarah had her apron on also, and uh, they were just always clean and nice. The sisters, Kretzinger recalls, were always friendly and welcoming. Very friendly place to come. And we probably had a little cookie or something early on. Probably had, would you like a cookie or something? And so. All three girls attended Logan Avenue Elementary the rural school, not the Kansas Avenue Town School. All three also attended Emporia High School and Kansas State Normal School, where the yearbooks reveal them to be handsome young women who were active in various organizations. Charlotte, for instance, was graduated in 1919 with a degree in history and English. She was active in the Omega Art Club, Young Women's Christian Association, and the European History Club. Her first teaching job was in Pratt, before returning to Emporia to teach English at Emporia High School. In 1934, she became librarian at both Emporia High and Junior High Schools, at some point earning an advanced degree in library science from the University of Illinois. In 1942, she married a widower, Dr. Clyde Wilson. As Lucia Davis recalls, Yes, yeah, Charlotte married the widower, Dr. Wilson. And uh, from what, uh, uh, what Sarah Genevieve told me, that uh, I think it was the son that kind of introduced them and kind of pushed them together. <laughs> I think you probably wanted someone to help take care of dad. <laughs> and I think it was, good, it was good for both of them, so. John Atherton, however, believes it was Dr. Wilson's daughter who played matchmaker. And Barbara Jean Wilson was the daughter of Dr. Clyde Wilson. And uh, when Barbara Jean's mother died, uh, Barbara Jean got Dr. Wilson and uh, Charlotte together and they were married. So she became Mrs. Wilson, Mrs. Clyde Wilson. Sometime around the time of their marriage, Dr. Wilson donated land on the northeast side of the ESU campus for a park. Priscilla, a member of Delta Gamma Rho sorority, received a degree in commerce and mathematics in 1922. Her activities included the commerce and mathematics clubs and the Young Women's Christian Association. She was also a member of the undefeated 1920 KSN state champion women's basketball team, which outscored its opponents 170 to 43. In her professional career, Priscilla was an official in the registrar's office at the University of Illinois, where she also taught. She was an excellent teacher, according to an unsolicited testimonial Shirley Hurt received. When my husband was sent to uh, Naval Defense College in Rome, Italy. I got to go along. And uh, we were talking, where are you from? One of the ladies said, and I said, Emporia, Kansas. And she said, really? She said, do you know Priscilla Howe? Said she was one of my favorite teachers. She had her in a class, although she was a, uh, what some had more of an administrative job there, but she did do some teaching and she was a good friend of hers. And so it was a small world because this couple was from Illinois. So she became good friends, so they were friends all the time that she was at the university, she said. So I thought that was really yes. kind of a fun thing that uh, I met one of the admirers of Priscilla. Yes. <laughs> the Kretzingers were neighbors of the House Sisters, and John Kretzinger recalled a particular visit from Priscilla and Sarah. Dad had one good experience that he never forgot. Dad built a bunch of uh, purple Martin houses, and he had three of them down at the house. And one of the last times that Sarah and Priscilla came, Priscilla always drove the car, 
and she backed down through a field and knocked one of his birdhouses down. <laughs> the Krumi family lived across the street from the house and David Krumi was often employed to do yard work, mowing the lawn and the ditch in front of the house with a non-motorized push lawnmower. I, I liked doing yard work even back then. I'd never liked mowing ditches, and I don't know if you all realize what ditchers are like to mow, but there was a long ditch along Logan, um, and she'd have me trim the bushes with hand trimmers. Um, so it was labor intensive. David also remembers watching the farm work south of the house. Um, but I remember the crops, you know, it was being able to watch a wheat harvest or a corn um, harvest and the dust and dirt it blew into our house with the south winds, um, watching combines and, um, and, and it seems like one time I remember um, they brought in um, a horse driven plows to turn the soil. And I thought that was kind of neat. So I was able to see those kind of things about farm life that, you know, I, I didn't know anything about. After returning to Emporia in retirement, Priscilla died in 1981, two years after Charlotte. Sarah, who majored in chemistry with a minor in speech, was graduated from KSN in 1926. Her activities included the Entree News Society, YWCA, and the Home Economics Club a subject she taught at a high school in Rochester, Minnesota. In 1942, she earned a master's degree in science from the University of Wisconsin. Before returning to Emporia in retirement, Sarah taught at Southwestern College in Winfield. Steve Hanshu, former president of the Lyon County Historical Society, and Sue Seelert, former education director of the Lyon County Historical Museum, remember Sarah as precise and no-nonsense. She was to the point, she could be curt. She would, you know, call you up and say it's time to come, and you dropped everything and went. And um, you know, you didn't say, "Well, I can't come right now." Um, you just came down here, and luckily the museum's close. And um, she had a certain agenda. You didn't interrupt it. Ms. Howe was very, of course, prim and proper, and uh, we went down in the middle of the afternoon, I believe, like two o'clock or so, to, to meet with her. And at four o'clock, we had to stop, and we had to have tea and cookies, uh, which was very typical of the Welch and British background. So that's one thing that uh, I remember. A and then when the time was up, like the appointment was from 2 to 4.30, we just stopped wherever we were at. And we would meet again the next time, so. Sarah Howe loved the house and farm and was determined to keep it properly, as Hanshu says. And there are other people who I believe have done work for uh, Miss Howe over the years who remember her and how everything had to be done exactly the way she said it and she meant it. But they always had fond memories though of her. In my memories driving by too is toward her later years was uh, her walking with her crutches down Logan Avenue getting her exercise every day. And you would see her out there and she was probably as round as a toothpick and she was, still had that determination and willpower to get out there and, and to walk and to check over the property, making sure everything was in good shape and well maintained. Sarah may have been small and frail as she aged, but she had determination and a strength of will, as Hanshu relates. In the early 1980s, there was a group who wanted to put in a, uh, a golf, uh, shooting range over on the property t uh, across from the property here uh, to the southeast and she was very adamant that this would uh, affect the integrity of this property and when it came before the city commission she hobbled in with her cane and you could just tell the minute she walked in 
she commanded the respect of everyone. And when she got up and spoke, you know, they just perked up and listened. And uh, she told them that these oak trees were planted by her grandmother or mother in the 1930s. And they carried water in buckets to them to see that they would continue to grow. And those trees needed to be, were part of this property and needed to be protected along with uh, the rest of it. And that a, a driving range would destroy that with all the parking and people coming and going. And she did not want to see that. So um, the city commission did not grant the developer the developer the right to do that. So it remains that it is today, thanks mostly to her and her conversation with the city commission at that time. During her later years, the climb up the steep stairs leading to her second story bedroom became increasingly difficult. So Sarah moved into the one-story addition that had been built onto the west side of the house. Lucia Davis, a neighbor, helped to care for Sarah during the last dozen years of her life. That was March of 1984. And it was at that point uh, her doctor uh, had told her that she simply could not be alone and uh, could not go back upstairs. Now, she didn't have to have someone uh, with her at all times at that point, but uh, she was absolutely not to go back upstairs. And it was at that point that she uh, uh, had the furniture changed in the new room. And the living room, that new room, became the, uh, well, it was literally a living bedroom <laughs> because it had her hospital bed and everything else in there. As the house sisters aged, they considered what to do about the house their grandfather had built. Well, before her sisters died, you know, they had discussed, you know, what, you know, what they could possibly do, you know, to, um, you know, so the property just didn't go, you know, to rack and ruin. When Charlotte died in 1979 and Priscilla just a couple of years later, Sarah began to think even more seriously about the future of the house. I'm sure her sister's last sister's death was what prompted her to think about the house and giving it to the museum. And, and it w had to have been a very difficult decision for her um, because this place is very precious to her and um, the memories of her family. So uh, I know that was what prompted the decision. Sarah wanted the house to be not only a memorial to her family's heritage, but also a kind of teaching museum. And at that time, Miss Howe was very interested in preserving the home and opening it up to the, the public, making sure that uh, it was available for especially children to see uh, as uh, a way to learn about historic preservation in the Welch family. If some agency would not accept ownership, maintain the house, and open it to the public, she would rather it be torn down than to have someone else live in it. I think, well, I don't know that I should say this, but I think Sir Genevieve would have preferred to have it bulldozed down than to have anyone else living in it. She wanted to donate the house to several different places, but she had some stipulations that the house needed to be preserved. And if it wasn't, she had said several times that she would rather see it demolished. Fortunately, the right recipient was found, the Lyon County Historical Society. The process of finding the right entity to receive and preserve the house began a few years after Emporians for Historic Preservation was formed in 1978. Steve Hanshu helped found the organization, which in turn helped to have the Howe House listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, our group also, Emporians for Historic Preservation, uh, nominated her house uh, for Kansas Preservation Alliance Award in 1991 and received that award in 1992. 
The decision on whether or not the Lyon County Historical Society would accept the donation of the Howe House and the 18 acres it sat on was not a foregone conclusion. For although Sarah Howe had included an endowment of $100,000, she had also imposed some conditions that required serious thinking. Uh, Laura Mae McEntee was president at that time. Uh, Sarah died in November of 1994, and in the will it stated that the historic society had 90 days to decide whether they wanted to accept the property then with the endowment. But we did discuss it for quite a while because it was a big commitment to take on the responsibility of the house. Could we do it? Could we maintain it the way she wanted to? Uh, and with the endowment that she uh, had provided. So it wasn't until I think almost up to the 90 days later, it seems like it was in February, March, where we finally made the decision that we did want to preserve it. I think really everyone was in favor of it. The concern was could we do it or not, but knowing that if it wasn't, the house would be auctioned off and sold to someone. The Historical Society Board had much to discuss. Uh, that Sarah had left the, the con well, the uh, how house and its surroundings, I guess you could say, uh, to the Lyon County Historical Society. And it had a lot of requirements uh, as to how it was supposed to be taken care of and some other details. And the attorney, Don Kruger, brought it to the meeting a major concern was the expense involved. Again, Laura May McEntee. And how, how much money it would be uh, cost us or how much money we might be able to uh, make from it. And of course, right there at the top of it, you might say the agreement is, uh, you know, <laughs> you cannot charge <laughs> to uh, see the property. And so, um, uh, it took a while. Another complication was that the small farm on which the house and other buildings sat could not be sold to help meet expenses, as Sue Sealert notes. This, the original tract of land is here, and she was very adamant in the donation that it stay as the original tract and continue to have the brome and then the field that could be planted. Fortunately, after nearly three months of often intense discussion, the Lyon County Historical Society Board of Directors agreed to accept the house and the accompanying responsibilities. We couldn't see how we could not accept the property and preserve it as one of the most unique uh, historic landmarks in Emporia and Lyon County. Preparations soon began to ready the house for showing to the public. Of sorting through the items in the house and determining what might be put on display, what might be placed in the Lyon County Museum archives, and what had no material or historical value and could be discarded. Early on in the process, a Howe House committee was formed. The, the three people that were on the board that left, that got involved in the first place, which was Elaine Eck, uh, Virginia Lowther and myself, we just, and we added uh, Jerry Brown. And uh, there were a couple other people by the time that, uh, that I left. Why, I don't know how many people we had on that committee, but anyway, we made all the decisions. That, that little committee made all it, and then we always took it back to the board. Again, Steve Hanshu. That group of ladies came in and actually sorted through things, identified everything. Uh, Lucia <clears throat> Davis was very helpful also, and they, at that time, we were determining 
how we wanted to present the house, whether we wanted to print in it from 1867 to the present or what time period we wanted to go through. And I, we finally decided that we wanted to represent in mostly uh, the 1860s on up to probably the 1880s or so, somewhere that time period. Uh, so we removed all the, some of the modern fixtures that were in there. Uh, being a very small house, it was very crowded with a lot of furniture and there was uh, modern chairs and uh, footstools and different things like that. So we eliminated those things and uh, tried to put it back pretty much to the original part of the house, to the way, way it was in the 1860s as a, a Welch farmstead. And then with the addition of the house that was put on in the 1970s, I believe, uh, we kept some of those things uh, during that time period when the house was built, or the addition was built, and uh, Sarah and her sister were using that as a living slash bedroom. So that reflects a little bit more of the, the modern time. Sarah, I remember, told me that the addition was put on in such a way that it could be removed and the other porch that was there could be put back so that the house would look the way it did when it was built. Whatever they did, they were very conscious of the handiwork that her grandfather had done, making sure that the house was preserved exactly as it had been when it was built. It was their heritage and they wanted to see, and I, the granddaughters wanted to see that that was uh, very well respected and, and honored even when they did, did additions like this. So that uh, they were very conscious back then of uh, preservation. Whereas so many people then were wanting to tear things down because we were going through urban renewal and old is yucky and you know new is what we want to do. So she at that time knew uh, how important preserving our historic structures and the stories that they have with them and what they can tell us. So uh, we're very thankful for her insight in doing that. Among the many items in the house, Elaine Eck remembers particularly a packet of letters. I noticed in going through the paper goods, we came across packets of letters and there was a rubber band around them and it said written on the top, burn these when I'm gone. So I went to the lawyer and I said, do we have to burn these? And he says, yeah, you do. I, you know, I thought, I hated to destroy something that might be historically significant, but um, I said, well, I'm going to go through them. I'm not going to read them, but I'm going to make sure there are no clippings and that there's no money in any of these envelopes. And so I did. And I noticed off time a letter would be from a Sunday school teacher that would say, we missed you last Sunday. Hope you'll be here next Sunday. The mail was used a lot more than the telephone because it wasn't as expensive as the telephone. And so a lot of them, and they didn't throw anything away on every one of those letters. The backs of it had a grocery list. <laughs> so you know they were using everything properly. Joyce Kennedy recalls the daunting task of making the house ready for public viewing. Our purpose from the very beginning was to be able to show the house. Well, you have to be able to walk through it before you can show it, and, and it was in pretty bad shape. We walked into this house and it was stuffed with furniture. <laughs> there was so much, uh, there was, you know, so much clothing and so, and so many chairs and so, so many things as far as being, there's too much furniture for, furniture for the space. 
And uh, so we did get rid of some things. We were able to clear enough out and move enough things around and put them in different places so that we could have tours and bring people in. It was not easy. There's so much in this house. Some of the modern items in the house, such as the refrigerator and kitchen stove, were transferred to the Lyon County Historical Museum and replaced with period pieces, such as a wood cook stove that had been used by the house. Joyce Kennedy tells about finding the stove. The um, stove we found in the barn. We were cleaning out the barn and we ran into this stove. And oh my goodness, it was such a mess. And we pulled it out and it was so, it was iron. And we pulled it out and thought, oh my goodness, look at this and didn't think it could be restored, didn't think that we could do anything with it, but we, we turned it up on right side up the way and <laughs> started cleaning it off and cleaning it out. And um, we found that it was this perfect, wonderful, wonderful stove. And, uh, and we were able to take it to... Uh, oh, Texaco, you told me. Yeah, Texaco and they were able to restore it. After much hard work by the volunteers, the house was finally ready for show. And on December 6, 1996, during the annual Holiday Homes Tour in Emporia, the Howe House opened to the public, a tangible reminder of the Welsh heritage of this area of Kansas. Elaine Eck remembers the outpouring of visitors. The Howe House was on home tours for a few years because people were wanting to get in it. I, we had a young man come by one day for a tour and, and um, we were visiting with him and he said, um, I used to be her paper boy. But he said, no matter how cold it was or how bad the weather was when I came by to collect, she never let me in the house. So he said, I've been dying to see this house for a long time. And, and I could understand that, you know. But um, we had people who responded very much to the house. And also, there was a relative, a distant relative who came and visited and had, I think Joyce took her around for, for a tour. Docents provide information to visitors or lead them on tours of the house, as Nancy Boyce, Education Director of the Lyon County Historical Society, sometimes does. In keeping with Sarah Howe's wishes that her grandfather's house would serve an educational function, the Howe House has been the site of vintage baseball games and also of living history programs. Joyce Kennedy, who helped to initiate those programs, recalls. Oh, we had five living histories. Tremendous amount of work, um, and so we brought all kinds of things onto the grounds, and uh, that would uh, take us back in time to uh, even before the time of this of this house. Uh, each time it got bigger, and the last time we had we had an Indian. Uh, with teepees and all kinds of things. But we also had a um, uh, stagecoach, like a stagecoach type thing. Um, and it would go out and turn around and come back and you know take them clear around the acreage. And we had a good time. Each time it got, it got larger, we had the reenactors that were Civil War reenactors, and they put on a show and um, they were here for two of them, I believe, two, two of the uh, living histories. Um, uh, we had homemade soap, and, and they were showing us how, how to make soap, and, they, and we had uh, uh, sour cream, and we put in and, and turned and got butter. And so some of them thought they'd never get better because they'd, they'd turned this thing the entire time of the, and it had never gotten anywhere. 
but it's hard to get the butter from the kinds of things you buy today because it's it just won't work. You have to have a real cow, and that's hard to find. The Howes, however, were only one among the many Welsh families who chose to immigrate to Lyon County for their new homes. The first two men of a dozen Welsh settlers in the Emporia area in 1857 were George Lewis and David Morris. Some of these early settlers were skilled craftsmen. David Morris was a shoemaker, Howe was a stonemason and builder, and Conway Rees was a woodworker and a furniture maker. Many pieces of Reese's furniture have been preserved by his granddaughter, Marilyn Lambert Hoy. Most of the immigrant Welsh, however, were farmer stockmen, making their living from the land. The Welsh call themselves thrifty people. Trevor Rees, longtime member of Sardis Church, which sits southwest of Emporia, amidst the farmland originally settled by early Welsh pioneers in this area, knew the Howe sisters from their work with the Welsh Bible Society. Commenting on the natural Welsh tendency to economize, he notes. There was a saying that uh, the Scotsmen were close, but the Welshmen had the print of the money on their thumb and their forefinger. <laughs> that tendency, a good one of the Welsh to waste not, want not, is well illustrated by an incident that happened to Randy Davis, who often performed yard tasks for Sarah Howe. A lot of times I, I'd, I'd come here to, you know, to, she'd have some project. And uh, one of the times, uh, she, one of the leaves cleaned out of the gutters. And it's no, no problem. So I grabbed the garden hose and, and a trash bag and went up and did the lower part of the, of the house up here, no problem. So I thought I'd better get the upper, upper part, did north, north gutters, no problem. And, and uh, got to working on the back side of the eaves there. And, and of course, it's a pretty steep roof. And uh, it was wood, wood shakes. And I had neglected to take into consideration that the bag was getting pretty heavy. And the Roof got kind of slick once it got wet, and there got come to a point where I knew I wasn't going to be able to hold on anymore. So I threw the trash bag over the edge, fell down on the top of the kitchen roof there, and kind of bounced and rolled off of that and down into the rose bushes that were on the south of the house there. And so I was laying there, and not not hurt bad, but just kind of knocked the wind out of me and laying there trying to catch my breath. And I just knew that I hit so hard that I, I was I was worried about having to replace the plaster of the, the ceiling in the in the kitchen. And and uh, about that time, Sarah come around the corner of the house and oh, and this is not good. And if nothing else, even if the ceiling's fine, she's going to give me heck for smashing the rose bushes. And she come around around the corner of the house. She says, Mr. Davis. I don't mind if you stop to take a break, but I wish you wouldn't waste that good city water. <laughs> I've, I've turned the hydrant off. If, when you get time to go back up on the roof, finish the job, we can, we can turn the water back on. <laughs> Thrifty is not stingy, however, and the thrift of the House Sisters was matched by their generosity to the Emporia community and beyond. Not only were the Howe House and Wilson Park made as gifts to the community, but in 1983, Sarah donated 12 acres of woodland near Redding Lake to the biology department at Emporia State University to be used as a research area. Speaking on behalf of her late sister Priscilla, Sarah said, Our primary concern was the preservation of the integrity of the longtime wooded area. We asked ourselves, could we not provide an invaluable opportunity for students to pursue biological studies in a natural habitat? This concern for students is manifested even more strongly in the Robert Howe Educational Trust Fund, which Sarah established not long before her death in 1994. She did this in honor of her father, who in 1878 had gone west to work in the gold and silver mines of southwestern New Mexico. He remained there until his return to Emporia in 1897, 
about the time of his marriage to Margaret Jane Griffiths. Sometime during this time period, Robert bought two gold and silver mines. One he named Ivanhoe, and the other he named Emporia, after his hometown. The income from these mines provides the money for the trust fund set up by his daughter. Steve Bell, of the Trust Department of ESB Financial in Emporia, manages the Robert Howe Trust Fund. I know the mines by uh, Mr. Howe went into it. He, he purchased them, like I said, in, I think around 1898. Her, their father had to move back, I think, for health reasons, but he always believed that he wanted to hold these mines because they, they produced, but he always wanted to keep them. So, Although the mines, for which a Canadian company pays a monthly lease, are not currently in active production, they still contain valuable veins of both silver and gold. The Emporia and Ivanhoe both have um, gold and silver. It's not the, what you see on TV with the panning and things like that, it's hard rock. And so, um, it's like anything else, there's, there's a vein, and you can, it's pretty explicit, and as it gets deeper, it gets, down there it gets wider. And so that's what they want. They want the vein and then they'll take the ore out crush it and then there's leech pads. The mines are located in a remote and colorful area. Um, it's nice, you know, go up by four-wheelers and you go through this called town of Grafton, which looks just like out of a movie set. I mean, it's deserted, the buildings are still there. I mean, it's, well, you could see some elk and we've seen some, um, actually deer and, and occasionally a cougar. The purpose of the trust is to provide scholarships of $500 each for graduates of Hot Springs High School in Sierra County, where the Ivanhoe and the Emporia Mines are located. The Howe scholarships have made it possible for many of the students there to go to college and thus escape the poverty of Sierra County. Usually, some 20 scholarships are awarded annually. Over the course of 20 years now, that is a significant sum. Well, you probably well. I'd say at least in excess of a hundred thousand dollars, probably. Mm -hmm. That'll be nice too. It won't stop as long as things are still there. So it is not only in Emporia and Lyon County that the Howe legacy lives on, but in Sierra County, New Mexico, as well. Celtic people are renowned for their musical abilities, and the Welsh excel in choral singing. The Eisteddfod an ancient traditional gathering in Wales, where musicians and poets met in competition, was brought to the Emporia area by Welsh settlers around 1870. After a few years in their new home, however, the local Welsh gave up the Eisteddfod and in 1888 instituted a new musical tradition, St. David's Day, in which they annually honor the patron saint of their home country. St. David was uh, a Welsh saint, so to speak, and his birthday was, I think I'm getting this right, March, around the 1st of March or March 1. So the first Sunday in March for 75 years, there has been a St. David's Day concert in Emporia. And it used to be a whole big, when more of the Welsh, local Welsh people were still alive, a huge a group of singers, and now we have to pull in people of other origins <laughs> to have enough voices. Apparently unique in both Wales and this country, St. David's Day features a program of choral music. In the year 2013, Emporia held its 125th annual St. David's Day celebration. It also marked the 21st and last appearance of guest conductor Geraint Wilkes, a native of Aberystwyth, Wales. Richard Howe lived in the stone house he built for some 42 years. No other family has ever occupied this building, which housed three generations of the Howe family from 1867 to 1994, a total of 127 years. Today it stands at the north end of a field, just as it did when it was first built. A monument, not only to the legacy of the Howe family, but also to the early pioneer days when immigrants from Wales first arrived in Emporia and Lyon County. It is part of Emporia's history, and as Elaine Eck notes, we all need history. A 
like history. And so it's interesting to me. Um, I sometimes think it doesn't hurt you to know where you've been before you know where you're going.